My name is Stephanie Clark, and I am a psychologist at Stanford, who, and I work here um, in the DBT RISE IOP for adolescents. And this is my colleague, Dr. Michelle Burke. She is a, um, an assistant professor at Stanford as well. And so what we're going to be doing tonight is talking about um, teen suicide and risk factors and myths and other kinds of things. And so we would like to welcome you to ask any questions that you have throughout the presentation. Um, we sort of find it more fun and lively that way, and we hope that you will too. So if you do have a question, please go ahead and ask it. Um, we may ask you to save it till the end if it's something we're going to get to. Um, also, because this can be a sensitive topic, if you need to step out of the room and take care of yourself, please feel free to do so. Before we get started, we're going to be talking about a few different terms, and we want to make sure that we're all on the same page tonight as we're talking about these things. So we're going to make a distinction here between suicidal ideation, which are thoughts about suicide, and we break those into two categories, into active th thoughts, as in I want to be dead, I want to die, I want to kill myself, or passive thoughts, I'd be better off dead. Okay? A suicide attempt is a potentially self-injurious behavior that is associated with some evidence of an intent to die. This is in contrast to non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. This is what we refer to the things that we see in our community that are going on with our teens, things cutting, burning, scratching oneself. This is non-suicidal self-injury. And the biggest differentiator between a suicide attempt and non-suicidal self-injury, well, there are a few things, and we'll get into those later. But with non-suicidal self-injury, there is no intent to die. Okay? The function of that is different, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Any questions on any of those definitions? OK, good. National statistics. So let's lay the groundwork for why we're having this talk. Suicide is the third leading cause of death among 10 to 14-year-olds and the second leading cause of death among 15 to 34-year-olds. 17.2% um, of adolescents in the U.S. report seriously considering suicide, and 7.4% report a suicide attempt in the past year. That's from a rel relatively recent paper. The prevalence of both suicidal ideation and suicide attempts increases dramatically during adolescence. Suicide rates have continued to rise across age groups in the United States over the last 15 years, with females aged 10 to 14 showing the greatest increase, 200%, across groups. And rates of non-suicidal self-injurious behaviors in the United States, so cutting the, that, those behaviors that I was referring to on the previous slide, are also increasing. And what we're seeing is that, well, actually, I don't think we know if they're increasing. But what we do know is that they're fairly high um, for adolescents. So 17.6% total, 24% among girls, 11% among boys. Okay. So the reason that we're here tonight is because of these statistics. So again, what we really hope that you'll leave here tonight with are knowing more about the risk factors, what you can do if you have a teen, in, if you have a teen or a teen in your community who you're concerned about, um, and what kinds of resources there are available for you. Let's talk a little bit about whether or not you should be concerned about your teen. So I'm sure those statistics were alarming. They're alarming to us too, and so. Um, do you need to be concerned about your teen or not? I'm sure is a question um, that if you are the parent of a teen, you're asking yourself. So research has identified many risk factors for suicide or suicide attempts in adolescence. The difficulty is that even though we know what risk factors are, so we know who's at higher risk, we don't know, based on research, how to predict who will actually attempt suicide at any given time or who might die by suicide. So the science is still a long way away from where we would like it to be, where we could predict with accuracy which kids might actually harm themselves, and then we can just intervene with those kids. So we don't know that, but what we do know is what puts kids at elevated risk. So these are some of the things to think about when thinking about whether you should be concerned about your teen. But also keep in mind that any one of these things alone will not cause someone to attempt suicide. Suicide is complex and caused by many factors. So again, even if your teen has some of these risk factors, that not, it's not necessarily a cause to panic. 
Um, but it might be a reason to think about implementing some safety precautions, which we'll go over um, in some other slides. So one of the biggest risk factors for suicide is having made a past suicide attempt. So if your child has attempted suicide before, um, unfortunately, they will remain at higher risk for the rest of their lives of attempting suicide again. Again, that doesn't mean that they will kill themselves or attempt suicide again, but they're at higher risk. And research has shown that um, most people who've attempted suicide do not die by suicide. I think it's around 90% of those who've attempted suicide do not actually go on to die by suicide. So it's still unlikely, but it's important to know that that's a very well-studied risk factor and we know the risk increases because once we know that someone has that sort of in their behavioral repertoire, it just it, it's still there. We know they could go to that extreme again under certain circumstances. Um, recent research has also shown that non-suicidal self-injury, so like Stephanie talked about cutting, burning, is also a risk factor for suicide attempts. And we'll go over non-suicidal self-injury in a lot of detail. Um, some of these risk factors, as you can hear as we talk about them, are things that can be changed. And some of them are things that cannot be changed. For example, if someone has made a past suicide attempt, there's no way to undo that. So that's something to be aware of that we can't change, but we might want to watch that person more carefully. And then there's some things that we can definitely change and we should change, and those are the kinds of things we're going to talk about. And one of those is access to weapons or lethal means, particularly guns. Um, and we know that removing access to guns and other lethal means greatly reduces suicide rates. And again, we're going to go into that in more detail. So that's a risk factor you can take immediate action to reduce. Um, we know that suicide occurs in the context of psychopathology, most commonly depression. So there's an older statistic that about 90% of people who die by suicide meet criteria for major depression. However, most people with major depression will not die by suicide. So again, you know, the information is useful and not useful at times. But um, people don't attempt suicide or die by suicide out of the blue. It's always in the context of some sort of underlying psychiatric difficulty. Um, we also know that severe emotion dysregulation or the tendency to have very um, quick escalation to negative mood is associated with um, suicidal behavior and a lot of suicide attempts I'd say the large proportion of them are impulsive in the heat of the moment when somebody is in a, a state of severe emotion dysregulation. Um, the tendency to be aggressive or violent or to get, engage in other types of dangerous um, or risky activities is associated with a, the, a greater ability or lower threshold for being harmful to oneself. Impulsivity, alcohol, and substance abuse is associated with suicide attempts um, and death by suicide, in part because using those substances can lower the threshold for engaging in a self-harm behavior because the person's judgment is impaired in that moment, as well as people who have a, a substance um, you know, addiction, often that can also lead to hopelessness and depression and despair and, and other risk factors that um, lead towards suicidal behavior. Um, we know that a history of child sexual abuse is associated with suicidal behavior, family conflict, and we'll get into this a lot later, but we know that family conflict in teens is associated with suicidal behavior and that family cohesion is a protective factor. Now, we all know that teens are very hard to get along with, <laughs> so we will um, give some tips for how to reduce family conflict, but what's really important is that your teen feels positively enough about their relationship with you and trusts you enough that if they are in trouble, they will come to you for help. That, that's perhaps the, the biggest safety uh, thing that you can do is, is to be there and have your kid feel comfortable going to you to ask for help if they're at risk. Um, we know that certain types of triggering events, particularly those that lead to humiliation, shame, or despair can often be sort of the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of someone who's at risk that pushes them to the point of actually doing something. And this is where things like bullying come in because that's often associated with humiliation or shame or hopelessness. There's also research the first night of incarceration is associated with high risk of suicide. Um, another big risk factor is hopelessness or the belief that one's problems can't be solved and that kind of goes hand in hand at times with poor problem solving abilities. So people who 
have this difficulty instead of being able to think through, okay, I have this problem, let me think about ways to solve it, quickly go to, I have this problem, it can't be solved, suicide is the only way out. And so we work in therapy a lot to help people um, reduce hopelessness and look at things differently. We know a, a genetic history of suicide in the family increases risks. So if there's been suicides in first degree relatives, again, that's something we can't do anything about, but that would be a kid who we might wanna keep an eye on. Um, severe insomnia, particularly when it's paired with agitation, um, is a risk factor that requires pretty immediate attention um, because that's been shown to be associated with suicidal behavior pretty soon after that. So if someone hasn't slept for a couple of days and they seem to be getting more and more agitated and dysregulated, it's really critical to get that person to sleep and to work with a um, physician or psychiatrist if medication is necessary to do whatever it takes to get that person sleep. Um, acute psychosis is associated with suicidality, particularly for someone who's having hallucinations or hearing voices telling them to kill themselves. We already went over bullying. Um, being in an LGBTQ group uh, increases risk, again, because it can be associated with shame, despair, hopelessness, um, stigma, um, bullying, and then contagion will go over more. That's another risk factor which we can do something about, and we'll talk about that extensively, but teens are very vulnerable to being influenced by the behavior of other teens, and I'm sure everyone here is very aware of the suicide clusters that have occurred here, and that's sort of the most extreme example of contagion um, where teens, um, you know, a, a lot of the way they decide how to behave themselves is based on what they observe peers doing. And so once there's a, a suicide in the community, or once there's a lot of talk about suicide in the media, um, we'll talk about 13 reasons why at the end. I mean, it, it, can, it can really spread and be contagious, as well as more day-to-day -day interactions on social media. And so that's something that's important to be aware of, and we'll talk about how to address that also. Okay, there's also some warning signs that someone is in imminent danger, that they might be planning or preparing to do something to harm themselves sometime soon. Again, these are not you know, definitive. Someone could be doing some of these things and they're not necessarily going to try to kill themselves. But these are things where if this is going on, you probably wanna seek um, medical attention from a mental health professional. Um, most importantly, anything that indicates planning or preparing for suicide should be considered very high risk and that person should have immediate evaluation. So if someone is texting people, posting on social media, telling friends, telling you I want to kill myself, I'm going to commit suicide, I would take that 100% seriously and have them evaluated. Um, giving hints that they, they are anticipating not being alive. I won't be a problem much longer. If anything happens to me, I want you to know. Um, talking about being a burden to others, feeling trapped, experiencing unbearable pain, or saying they have no reason to live. Um, actual preparations, again, are of high concern. So if someone has written a suicide note, um, and that would include a, a post about goodbye to people or things like that on Facebook or other social media, giving away things, um, throwing things away like so people don't find them after someone is not alive anymore would be concerning, and then researching means or ways to die that seem to suggest planning, like researching train schedules or train um, stops or things like that. So all, all of this is signs that the person is seriously considering suicide or planning for suicide, and that you want to act on immediately. Um, severe depression, again, we know severe depression can be associated with suicide, but people can also have depression and not attempt suicide. That, that's the more common course, but it's important to be aware of severe depression, whether or not someone is suicidal. Severe depression requires mental health treatment. And one thing that, that for a while people have seen as a cause for concern is that if someone has been very, very depressed and all of a sudden they seem cheerful, that you should be skeptical of that because that might mean that they have decided they're going to kill themselves and what you're seeing is sort of a relief or um, a, a momentary break from depression because the person thinks relief is coming because they're going to be dead. Um, so it doesn't always mean that. I mean, people could be getting better from depression, but that's something to be mindful of. Again, I went over insomnia already. 
and then if there's been a recent life event associated with a lot of humiliation or shame and some of these other risk factors are there, that would be a time to be more um, observant of your child and more careful. Okay, so why do people attempt suicide? We have all of these risk factors. H how do these all interact with each other? Um, and one way to think about it is suicide attempts are generally the result of some underlying risk factors and whether that's depression or another psychiatric condition, um, a genetic predisposition, a prior history of self-harm behavior, um, hopelessness, difficulty with problem solving. So th there's usually multiple of these underlying risk factors. And when there's a situation that occurs that, again, is associated with shame, humiliation, extreme hopelessness, that can trigger someone to choose to act in that moment. And people attempt suicide because they want to end some sort of unbearable experience, whether it's unbearable emotional pain or a situation that seems unbearable. Suicide is a form of escape, and it particularly goes along with hopelessness because if you think about, if you feel that you're in unbearable pain or you're in an unbearable situation and it's never, ever, ever going to go away, you can't think of any way to solve it, you're gonna be stuck with this forever, then the idea of suicide starts to make sense. Um, and so that's sort of the mindset that people are in when they attempt suicide. And then of course in treatment, we do everything we can to show them that that is um, you know, distorted thinking and that there are ways to solve problems and that there are ways to reduce pain. But that's sort of the mindset of a suicidal person. And like I said before, causes of suicide are complex and multi-determined. So the media always wants to boil it down to something really simple that can be in a tagline. Bullying causes suicide. Yeah. Um, and that's a very, very simplistic and misleading um, description. Bullying might be associated with suicide, and like I said, particularly if it leads to hopelessness in a kid who's already vulnerable to depression or hopeless thinking or poor problem solving. But bullying alone does not cause suicide. There's multiple factors involved, that being one of them. Of course, if your child is being bullied, I would recommend you do everything you can to stop that from happening, but that alone does not cause suicide. Suicide can't be reduced to one simple reason. It's very complicated, and that's what makes it so hard for us to predict and to understand who exactly might be at risk, because there's so many factors involved, and often it's very impulsive. So it, someone who might do something in one moment might not the next, and so it's just very hard to predict or explain. Still me? Okay. Still you, protective <laughs> so there are protective factors that are positive signs that someone would not attempt suicide. And one of those is having a lot of reasons for living um, and things to look forward to in the future. This can get complicated with teens because their idea of the future is, is very short, right? If it's not happening next week, forget it. It's never happening. Um, and often teens are still forming their identities and, and wondering if what their future is going to be like. So it's not exactly the same as adults where, you know, my reasons for living are my career, my children. I mean, they're, they're a little distant from that. But it's still having reasons for living or things to look forward to in the future is definitely protective. And one of the things that we think about when we um, are evaluating kids is are they saying, you know, I'm looking forward to going to this concert next week or I want to go to college at this school because that gives you a sense that they're thinking they're going to be alive in that amount of time to do that. Um, have feeling a sense of responsibility or connection to friends, family, pets um, that the teen would not abandon. So some kids and adults will say, I would kill myself, but I would never do that to my little sister. I would never do that to my parents. And then we say, great, don't do that to them. <laughs> That's a good choice. Um, pets can go a long way. I, I have mm -hmm. patients who have completely changed their views on life because they fall in love with their pet and would never want to abandon their pet. So those are things that are protective. Obviously being, you know, the, the more they feel protected and, and good in their social relationships and with their family. Um, we know that being afraid of death is a protective factor. Um, in some ways it's not healthy to be afraid of death, but in this case it's, it's very good. We want them to be afraid. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. Yes, it is scary. 
Um, if someone has religious beliefs that did not allow for suicide, and like I said, having plans for the future, we take as a good sign. I mean, again, if someone's saying all sorts of scary things and they say, but I'm going to a concert next week, I'm not going to say, oh, well, you're fine. We'll, we'll take it in context, but it's a good sign if they're having some kind of future-oriented thinking. So back to non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. Um, so again, the common, some of the common methods are cutting, burning, scratching, head banging. Um, these are typically what we've seen and what, what folks who are writing about this in the literature have seen. Again, um, what differentiates an SSI from a suicide attempt is that in an SSI, there is no intent to die. So why are we talking about non-suicidal self-injurious behavior on a night where we're talking about teen suicide, you may be asking yourselves. Well, we are talking about it because it is a huge risk factor for suicide attempts. So just anecdotally speaking, in our clinic at Stanford and our program here at CHC, the kids that we see are struggling with suicidality and self-harm, all of it. So they're highly comorbid. Let me ask you this. So sometimes, in, so in our community, in our society, I often hear people say, oh, sh yeah, she cuts herself. She's just doing it for attention. attention. That's right. And let me tell you something about this. This is a really damaging belief to hold, and it's far too simplistic. So somebody may not have the skills or the words or the ability to communicate the kind of pain or suffering that they're in. And maybe for that person, that is the only way that they can communicate that. But even if that's the case for that person, it's not just as simple as this person is looking for attention. There's surely a lot going on there. Also, many kids who engage in self-harming behavior hide it. So it doesn't work out in that way either. So <coughs> um, the treatment for NSSI is to figure out the function of the NSSI behavior. I know I see the facial expressions. I'm going to really explain this in a minute and give some examples. So we wanted to determine the function of the, of the cutting behavior, whatever the NSSI behavior is, and give kids other more effective ways of getting their needs or desires met. So OK, let's talk about function of a behavior. So if I'm in line at Target with my three-year-old, who I don't have, I don't have, I don't have any kids. But let's say I'm in line with a three-year-old, and she starts throwing a tantrum, and I get embarrassed and impatient, and I just give her some skills. She quiets down. So the next time I go into Target, she asks me for the Skittles. I say no. She starts tantruming. Yeah. What's the function of that tantrum, probably? To get the Skittles. Yeah. So the function of a behavior, typically the functions of a behavior are either to get something or to avoid something. So in our suicidal adolescents or in our self-harming adolescents, things that we might see are things that have been sort of accidentally paired are a, a child engages in self-harming behavior and then the parents really back off expectation. I mean, when your child self-harms, it becomes really clear to you what's important, right? So might back off expectations, might make more demonstrations of love. So what is this child potentially pairing? Well, if they continue to cut themselves, they'll continue to get love from their family? Yes. So the function could be to get people to back off, okay? So, but there's another important point that I really want to make here. So <clears throat> just because something is paired or because it, the, the, it's a, it doesn't mean that the adolescent is consciously aware of that pairing. So up here, there, oh, it's somewhere else on the slide. Sometimes parents come to us and they talk about feeling manipulated. Oh, well, you know, whenever I put an expectation on my child, then she goes off and does this or she threatens this. It is, it is never conscious. These parents, pairings are never conscious. Um, but what is important is that we figure out what the function of the self-harming behavior is. And I'm going to talk about some common ones in a moment here. They're on the next slide. And what we do is we figure out other ways to bolster skills or help kids get what they're really asking for or really needing in different ways that don't involve self-harm. Okay. So self-harm generally does not require hospitalization. Um, it is the case that you know, an adolescent might begin self-harming and it might turn into a suicide attempt, just to make this a little more complicated, and in that case, yes, you do. Um, and of course, if an adolescent um, does do some kind of harm that needs immediate attention, they might need medical care, but generally this does not require inpatient hospitalization, whereas a suicide attempt certainly would. <clears throat> and the way that we, the, our first line of defense um, against protecting an adolescent who is using self-harm is to remove the means of self-harm 
from them, easy access to, self, to means of self-harm. So this means things like razors and even like the little pencil sharpeners that can be broken apart that have razors in them. A lot of our kids um, are keen on those. Uh, knives, anything that your child is using to self-harm, you want to reduce their access to that. Okay. Okay. So these are some of the common reasons for NSSI. So for a lot of our kids who we see in our programs, the core problem is really emotion dysregulation. That is the core problem. And so kids are often doing this in order to um, distract from emotions, have some kind of sensation that distracts from emotions. And so the function of self-harm for them then is to be able to tolerate these really, really negative emotions that they're experiencing. Um, others engage in NSSI to reduce dissociation. Um, some do it for interpersonal communication. That might be along the sort of attention seeking, what I was talking about, if kids don't have any other way or don't think they have any other way to communicate their suffering. And then a good number of kids that we see also hurt themselves as self-punishment. They feel they've done something wrong. All right. So <clears throat> I think we've made this point several times, but we're, going <laughs> we're apparently going to keep making it, that we're talking about um, NSSI on a night where we're talking about suicide because it really is such a huge predictor of suicide attempts in youth. So, and again, you know, we see this in our clinics all the time. Research has born, been borne out in research that adolescents are often engaging in both NSSI and suicide, suicidal behavior um, concurrently. And we certainly see that. It's very rare, at least in my experience, it's been very rare to see somebody, well, maybe somebody who is more people who are suicidal, but less who come in with um, self-harming who aren't in some way suicidal. So there's, this no there's another interesting idea that NSSI might increase the risk of engaging in suicidal behavior and may serve as a gateway to attempting suicide. So potentially lowering the threshold of, of fear to kind of take that step further. Um, but we're not, we're not entirely sure why NSSI um, leads to suicide attempt, the mechanisms anyway. Okay. Um, any teen who has engaged in NSSI should be evaluated by a mental health professional. One, because that mental health professional has to really tease out and determine what the functions of that behavior are. Two, because that individual also needs a risk assessment and to be seeing someone consistently for therapy. And three, and three was going to be like the most important one. Let me see if it'll come back to me. Um, oh, most teens need helps to stop this. So, you know, parents will come and they'll, and they'll, you know, say, oh, we tried to do all these various different things or just tell him or her to stop. This is a very difficult thing to stop once a teen has used this because unfortunately, self-harm is actually really effective at the things that we had on the board. So things like, you know, cutting off an intense emotion, it's really effective at that, unfortunately. So kids need help learning how not to do this and replacing these behaviors with ones that are more appropriate and safe. Yes. Um, as you said, a lot of teens hide it from others or from their parents. What are tips or what are ways um, that parents can pay attention to see signs of NSSI? Signs of self-harm? Um, so, well, we do live, I've lived in the Midwest and the East Coast. I'm sort of new to California. We live in a climate where it's not uncommon for people to not be super bundled up, bundled up right? So if your adolescent is in a, you know, is in a t-shirt, I mean, places to look, we typically see on the legs um, or on the forearms. I mean, certainly kids do so in different areas, but those might be areas just, yeah. Do they generally do it alone or in groups? Typically alone. Um, I don't believe, hmm, the group question is interesting. Um, they're often, one thing we struggle with our kids is they often find our friends with other people who are engaging in these behaviors as well. So there's a lot of late night conversations, texts, and we're, we're trying to intervene on this in many ways, but a lot of late night texts around this person is really going to kill themselves, or this person is cutting, or this kind of, so they're kind of talking about, so I don't know. Uh, there's at least that. I don't know. I, I haven't heard of people in, you know, in groups self-harming together, but it's an interesting question. Yeah. I guess my question was, is, is this, but does this behavior, um, does it, is it, uh, does it ratchet up? In other words, if you have a, you have a team who's cutting themselves, mm -hmm. but is there a transition where the behavior escalates? It's an interesting question. Um, yeah. Because I'm just saying, okay, if they're cutting themselves, I mean, 
Who's to say that they don't, you know, cut their throat? You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm asking is, is there a gradual escalation here? I don't know if it's really that linear. Okay. Because, and we also have to take a step back and think about what the functions of these behaviors are, going back to that F word, that right, 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 yeah. the F function word, not yeah. the other F word. But, um, so, you know, so for a suicide attempt, the function is to escape with right. in finality, right? So the function of self-harming behavior, non-suicidal self-harming behavior, is to manage emotions. And so, um, you know, I've seen clients for a few years at a time who, you know, will have periods of not self-harming and then will return to it and, and they'll do it in really the same way, sort of over and over again. So I'm not seeing this maybe being sensitized to it and it needing to get, you know, sort of but worse I'm and worse. I'm wondering if there's a point of no return. I think there's a lot of research trying to answer that okay. question and what differentiates kids who will only stick with non-suicidal self-injury versus kids who will progress to suicide attempts. And I think the answer is that we just don't know that yet. Um, there's been some research showing that before the first episode of non-suicidal self-injury, teens have already thought about suicide, so had suicidal thoughts, suggesting that um, the non-suicidal self-injury is occurring after suicide has already been in their mind. Um, like Stephanie said, there's a large overlap. So a lot of kids who are engaging in non-suicidal self-injury have also attempted suicide, but it's not, it doesn't always overlap. There's okay. some kids who only attempt suicide and never engage in non-suicidal self-harm, and there's some who only engage in non-suicidal mm -hmm. self-injury and never go okay. on to attempt suicide. So we just, and we don't know how to predict who's gonna end up in what group. But like we talked about, the thinking is for kids who engage in chronic non-suicidal self-injury, so very frequently, that that can lead to suicide attempts because it, it breaks down sort of the inhibition around self-harm. Like most yeah. of us are motivated to not harm ourselves and right. avoid harm. So the more the person kind of breaks down that threshold, the more likely they might be to act on suicidal thoughts than someone who has not done those behaviors before. And you mentioned the self-cutting and then to prevent emotion. What does that mean? So Oh yes. Emotion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so what our adolescents who report this will say is that you know the the physical sensation of pain of the of the injury or even just the distraction of looking at you know the blood or the whatever it is is very distracting from whatever emotional crisis they were having. So it distracts completely away from whatever the suffering was. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they cut to the degree that bleeding, like Well, so there, there's a lot of scratching. <laughs> there's a lot of sort of scratching. You know, I wouldn't say that, I mean, just in terms of my own experience, I, I think I've had a couple kids come close to needing stitches, but that is not common. Um, yeah. You really just surface scratching. Yeah. Yes. How to tell if your teen is at risk. Ask him or her. Okay. So there is this myth that if we ask someone about suicide, that that will make them suicidal. And we are here to tell you that the research does not support that at all. And in fact, with all of the kids we see ever, we ask them questions about, have you ever thought about suicide? Have you ever thought about ending your life? Have you ever thought about hurting yourself in some way? Um, this is sort of the best way to get at, to get at this. Um, you also, of course, want to be aware of the warning signs and the risk factors that Dr. Burke reviewed as well. So any questions about this? Yeah. I love I love this question. I think it's a really important one. So when we're so when we're asking about suicide as clinicians, we're not asking about specific methods, right? In case we have someone suicidal in front of us who thinks, "Oh, I haven't thought of that." We are asking, "Have you ever thought about c killing yourself or ending your life or committing suicide?" However, it is that you prefer to word it. And then if the person says yes, we say, "Well, what have you considered?" And they tell us. So we you might ask, 
So have you ever, you know, hurt yourself on purpose when you've been really upset? Yes, I have. Oh, okay, what have, what have you done? Oh, I, well, I cut myself sometimes and sometimes I bang my head against the wall and yeah. So you want to always take communications about suicide and any self-harm seriously. So I think this links back to a couple of things. One, that um, self-harm is attention-seeking or that sometimes kids are saying that they're going to kill themselves for attention because it's such a hot button alarming thing. And the reality is that we just don't know. We as clinicians, we don't know. So whenever an adolescent is giving you information about feeling suicidal or about having urges to harm themselves, take it seriously. Um, <clears throat> so back to this. So. Um, and I was talking about the function, right? How certain things get paired or certain things serve as, the, you know, self-harm might serve as a function to get parents to back off. A lot of parents will come in and they'll say, oh, I feel really manipulated by my kid. Every time I try to do this or this or this, they threaten to self-harm or they do this. And what essentially is going on is, you know, your child at that point is doing the best that they can, giving the skills, giving the skills that they have. So it is unlikely that it is, it is even conscious in your child's mind that that is what they're doing. And if we have time to talk about DBT a little bit and we can talk a little bit more about this, yeah. Have you ever seen a case that that was true? Where someone has- Just trying to manipulate the parents. I think I would put it in different terms. I mean, I think actually the distinction we're trying to make here is the, the self-harm, we think about self-harming behavior as communication behavior. And so it's trying to communicate something, whether it be this is too much, you expect too much from me from school, I don't know how to handle my social group, whatever it is. But we don't consider it manipulative because the adolescent is typically not either not aware of it, and even if they are sort of aware of it, they don't know how to get it in any other way. So, so you don't think there's, okay, um, I'm just looking for a word like very rare or something like that, that a, a teen would express to their parents that they're thinking about killing themselves, but doing to manipulate the parents. I would say that's very rare, yes. Um, and I would be quite concerned about a teen who was pretending to be suicidal in order to get what they wanted, that that would be a, a very concerning behavior in its own right. And would, that person would need treatment regardless. So generally, if a kid is talking about suicide to you, it means that they're thinking about it and it's in their mind. Okay, myth, teens threaten suicide or engage in, oh, we covered this one, <laughs> engage in self-harm behaviors to get attention or to manipulate parents, eh, incorrect. Um, okay, so what should you do if you think that your teen may be at risk? One is to seek mental health treatment. And if you see some of the, so Dr. Burke talk about, talked about risk factors and also talked about warning signs, imminent warning signs or warning signs of maybe an imminent. So one, you, you, know, you want to seek mental health treatment. If you're worried that your child is exhibiting some of those warning signs or is indicating that they are in fact thinking about suicide and you're concerned that they might hurt themselves um, very soon, um, you might want to call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room for an evaluation. We also have, um, there were little cards on your seat that we hand out at our programs. Um, we give them to our teens and to our parents, and they have resources. So, you know, if your teen is suicidal, they have um, several different lines. They have the California Youth Crisis Line, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and teens in particular um, appreciate the Crisis Text Line because apparently nobody under the age of 38 talks on the phone anymore. <laughs> so, um, so, and then above here, there are some mobile units who will come out to you and do an assessment if you live in these counties. So there's Uplift for the residents of Santa Clara County, and then there is um, the San Mateo Crisis Intervention and Suicide Prevention Center for uh, residents of San Mateo County. So, oh, mob um, Uplift is mobile. I think you have to go to the, um, to the site in San Mateo. And kids can call these numbers too. We give kids all these cards mm -hmm. also because these are 24 seven hotlines yeah. that either the person who's suicidal can call themselves or a family member who's concerned about them. And there are extra cards on the table over there if, if anybody wants extras, yeah. And other schools in this area have these sort of cards that are somewhat similar. Uh, just a little note that the card here is more correct and this is the crisis next line. In the Bay Area, you should start the conversation with Bay, Bay uh, just for their data collection, they don't store uh, numbers. I have volunteered for them for 18 months. Um, so 
uh, to make you do that, it helps to show that this is something in the Bay Area because, of course, when you come in on a cell phone, who has, who has other than a 65 dollar area code on their cell phone? Quite a few people probably, right? Okay, because people move around to the old cell phone number. So this helps the, their data collection to know that these people, if you have interest, look at their website, they have a ton of data on what type of situations exist in what regions, at what time of day, what age group, all that stuff. Uh, and the more data they have, the better. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Do Davis cards for anybody or just for the risk kids or a family? Um, we usually give it to kids who we think might have some of the risk factors or who have already come in with suicidal or self-harm behavior. But um, at Stanford, we just have them kind of on our wall where all the business cards are, so they're available to anybody who wants to take one. It's actually nice for any student really, because they have friends. Um, and they have friends. That's a good point. That's a great point. Yeah. Okay, so what should you do if you think that your teen may be at risk? So Dr. Burke talked about this earlier in terms of maintaining a positive relationship with your teen so that she or he um, will be willing to, you, willing to come to you for help. So in our crisis clinic at Stanford, we help families to reduce conflict. We um, do some interventions which increase family support and validation. Um, and this other piece, I think we alluded to this before that suicidal and self-harming behavior is really communication behavior. It's sort of this cry for understanding. And so, you know, if you can try to tune into your kids and get a sense of what's going on with them before they hurt themselves, um, then you'll have a better chance. Did you want to add anything to that, Michelle? Um, I don't think so. I mean, suicide is not always um, a communication behavior. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but it's always good to um, you know, validate your kids' feelings and, and give them attention before they hurt themselves in the event that self-harm or suicidal behavior is part of a function of, of getting attention. You want to eliminate the need to get that from self-harm. Um, so one of the interventions that has the most um, empirical evidence is to restrict access to lethal means. So this means restricting access to things that a teen can use either to engage in a suicide attempt or in non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. So these include things such as um, sharps, uh, pills, poisons. Um, we encourage families to get a lockbox to keep um, knives and pills. We encourage families actually to get rid of pills if they can. Um, often teens are very good at getting into um, even small locks and, and things like that. Um, and uh, restricting access to things. Also, you know, if you're concerned about your teen driving the car, maybe they, you know, you take their keys for a few days. But the idea here is that. Um, you know, while we cannot absolutely prevent someone from finding a way to harm themselves, if we can make it harder for that person to do so, at least there are a number of steps where maybe they'll change their mind or where someone or we can intervene. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, so Dr. Burke uh, talked about firearms. Um, a suicidal individual should never have access to a firearm. And... Um, Oh, so there's a myth here. The myth is that there is no point in restricting access to lethal means because if somebody wants to kill themselves, they just will find another way to do it. Right? This is actually not the case, and especially when it comes to firearms. Yeah. Are there any statistics as to where children um, attempt suicide? Is it mostly at home? Or? That's a good question. I think yes. I might have this in here. Let's see. I believe it is at home, though. At least um, in the data from the study that was done in Santa Clara County in, in relation to the suicide clusters, the vast majority of suicides that occurred in this county over the past years that the suicide clusters had happened um, occurred at home. Mm -hmm. So only a small percentage occurred at the train or somewhere outside of home. Yeah. But quite a few occurred at the train here. Yes, but the much more occurred out within the home. They're talking about the whole county, not just here. Yes, I know. Yeah. But the, the clusters here often are the, the trains, and if we remove those grade level crossings, couldn't that improve? 
Definitely, 100%, yes. Um, and uh, you know, but when looking at all the suicides, though, in the county, the, the majority were still not the train. Um, and actually, the majority of them were, were young adults, not high school students as well. So obviously, you know, without knowing, it, it, the clusters are very concerning. Um, and you know, when you put it in the larger context, it looks a little bit different. Not that it's not incredibly concerning. Um, yeah. Can I just ask a follow-up question for that? Mm -hmm. Are there any data as to um, when it's the time of day? I guess it's after school when parents are not supervising, or is it late at night when they're supposed to be sleeping? That's a good question. I, I don't know the, I don't have a statistic off the top of my head, but I definitely think that um, times when there's less supervision are times where kids would be more vulnerable, but I, I don't know if there's like a, Time of day pattern, do you? Yeah, well, there's a time of day pattern for a certain uh, ideation and so on, but the actual event, it's hard to tell. But Chris Stickman has got a ton of this data saying at what time uh, and what day of the week and what age group and all these things, depending on how much data you have. So it can't be perfect. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff there. You can look at crisis trends, crisis, crisis trends. Mm -hmm. I think it's that word. Again, you have to keep in mind that this data does not necessarily um, explain any given individual's behavior. Um, so in general, we talk with parents about making sure that their teens are monitored if we're worried about them, um, and making sure that they don't have access to lethal means. Um, so that, that's important just in general, to, to not have times where kids are unsupervised if you are concerned about self-harm behavior. Um, so a suicidal individual should never have access to a firearm. We went over that. There's a lot of attention in the media around firearms and homicide, but suicide is actually a bigger problem um, in relation to firearms. More people die by suicide, so it's a huge public health issue. Um, like Stephanie said, it's a myth that there's no point in restricting access to lethal means. Um, if somebody wants to kill themselves, they'll just find another way to do it. That's actually not true in many cases because suicide attempts are often impulsive. And once that moment has passed, the person may not want to kill themselves anymore. Um, people are often ambivalent when they attempt suicide. And if they don't, they get past that moment, they may not do something else. And guns are particularly of concern because if someone uses a gun, they're likely to die versus other methods which are much less lethal, and even if they use them, they will be less likely to die. Um, so when do people take their lives? So this is, these are, this is a great website. It's called Means Matter. Um, it's run by the Harvard School of Public Health, and, and their agenda is to reduce suicides by firearms, and they have great information. So these are, slides are from them. Um, but in looking at the research, most suicides are impulsive. Um, that's why if you have a kid who's planning suicide, that's, you know, that's a big red flag because that's more rare than impulsive. Um, one third of youths who died by suicide had faced a crisis within the past 24 hours. So these things often happen quickly after there's a crisis. And again, if they get through that time safely, they may not um, want to attempt suicide anymore. Um, among people who nearly died by suicide, 24% said less than five minutes elapsed between deciding on suicide and making the attempt. So sometimes it's very impulsive, which again is why we try and remove lethal means, particularly guns. Um, suicide attempts are rarely out of the blue. Attempters typically face multiple problems, some long-term, some short-term. The moment when they take action is often during a brief period of heightened vulnerability. So this is what we went over before. One of the most powerful risk factors for suicide deaths is the availability of highly lethal methods. In the US, that means guns. Guns are the most lethal method. Um, firearms are used more than any other method of suicide. And most non-fatal suicide attempts are by overdose or cutting. So we don't want people doing any of those things, but they're less likely to die um, if they take medications or cut themselves than they are if they shoot themselves. Um, where there's more guns, there's more suicides. There's been tons of data on this. Another big study just came out recently showing this same thing. Um, again, this is the myth that we talked about. Won't an attempter just use another method if they don't have a gun? They might, but they're much more likely to survive by another method. 
Um, 90% of survivors of suicide attempts do not commit suicide after, so I went over this before. How do suicide victims get a gun? This is a very sobering statistic. 85% of youth who died by firearm suicide used a family member's gun, usually a parent. So they get it in their house. Um, we talk to parents a lot. Um, you know, whatever your sort of moral or ethical beliefs are about firearms, if you have an, a teen who's suicidal in your home, you should remove the firearm. Um, safe storage is a good secondary option, but it's not foolproof. Teens are very good at finding hidden things and figuring out how to put things back together and break locks and all sorts of uh, things like that. So it, it's not foolproof if you have it stored and locked. The best thing is to just get rid of it. Um, and and we, we can't emphasize that enough. Um, so other things to do if you think your teen might be at risk is to reduce contagion when possible. Of course, none of us can reduce this entirely. Um, but some of the things, oh, actually, let me give you the definition first before I go over what we can do. So suicide contagion is the exposure to suicide or suicidal behaviors within one's family, peer group, media that can result in an increase in suicide and suicidal behaviors. Um, direct and indirect exposure to suicidal behavior has been shown to precede an increase in suicidal behavior in persons at risk for suicide, especially adolescents and young adults. So this is based on a, a very um, uh, old and important finding in psychology back from when psychology was sort of developing a, as a field to understand human behavior. And, and we know that a big way that people learn all the behaviors that they do um, is by observing other people do them. So that's how we learn. And we're more likely to imitate the behavior of another person who we see as being similar to ourselves or having perceived positive qualities, someone who we admire. And when we see that person using a behavior and getting something we want by doing it, right? Like if, I, if a kid observes another kid yelling at their parent and then they get candy, they say, well, maybe I should try that. Um, so, and this is this very simple mechanism by which contagion occurs. So, if you have a teen who, you know, teens tend to define themselves and their identity by their friends. Um, and if their friend, you know, is doing something, if their friend is also depressed or, or having a hard time and they see their friend or someone else in their school who seems like them, presumably get their needs met by attempting suicide, they might do that themselves. Um, so it's really important to watch contagion among teens. This is a, really an issue among teens. It's less of an issue among adults because teens are so influenced by peers. Um, yeah. So I have heard the suicidal by the high school. My kids are small. Mm -hmm. And I have heard after each incident, like a big, big gathering, people mm -hmm. put a candle, the flower, make a huge scene. You know, I, I just kind of surprised by that, that almost encourage other kids to do it, become a hero by suicide. So the schools in Palo Alto specifically do not allow that to happen for that very reason. I can't speak to every school in the area. In Palo Alto, there's some other people, not us, but some of our colleagues at Stanford have worked very closely with the schools around reducing contagion, and that's a, a major thing because exactly what you're saying you, they don't you don't want to idealize or mm -hmm. portray this as a, a positive thing right, exactly. um, you know teens do want positive attention and if they see this person got attention it, there's a lot of contagion so that's actually that they stop that right away uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's good that you brought that up because that, that's know, definitely a problem like, I'm from different culture like shock for that one like, well, I think it's very, very tricky for the schools to manage this because you know the kids are grieving and, and it needs right. to be addressed. It can't be swept under the rug right. and they have to be very careful about how they choose to address it mm -hmm. so it doesn't cause contagion. So you know, I, I feel for the school staff that this is so tricky to, to manage. Um, so we know that there's contagion among suicidality from the media, so around TV shows, news reports, um, as well as amongst the teens themselves. So first to talk about the media, there are guidelines for the media which don't get followed 
often mm -hmm. about how to report on suicide in a safe way versus an unsafe way. So an unsafe way is to explicitly describe the method of suicide. Um, and if you read most news articles, even in the New York Times or very reputable sources, they will describe in detail, you know, Kate Spade hung herself or Tony Bourdain did this, that, and this. Isn't that um, just sensationalizing everything to get, head I mean, just for headlines or something? I think the journalistic argument would be, well, it's newsworthy, people want to know. Um, but at the same time, we know that, that there's contagion there. And I wonder yeah. if uh, Bourdain had contagion from Kate Spade, because it happened in the same right, right, right. week. Yeah. Um, and so we know that this is a problem, but it, it, the media does not often follow it. Um, you know, when they have dramatic or graphic headlines, you know, kid who was ostracized kills themselves as a way to, you know, get back at their peers. I mean, that's a disaster, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and you see it all the time. The, the, the guidelines are that things should be reported in a very objective you know, way with no details. So-and-so uh, died by suicide, end of story, if you need help, and to post all the emergency numbers, but to not get into anything that could glamorize it or give ideas about it. Um, so 13 Reasons Why is a great case example of exactly how not to portray suicide. Um, in the media. This was a, a total disaster, um, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, it, it caused a lot of suicides and copycat suicide attempts after this show was on, so we know it, it led to a spike in suicidal behavior. And all the problems with this are it included a very graphic scene in which a teen dies by suicide, so they, they show it in graphic detail, and I, I've had multiple patients do the exact same thing. I was in the tub and I cut my wrists. Did you watch 13 Reasons Why? Mm-hmm, yeah. So that's very bad. Um, and of course, th this was a very glamorous girl, very attractive, you know, who people might want to be like. Um, the portrayal of death by suicide was shown as an effective means of getting a desired outcome, in this case, revenge on peers who ostracized this girl or, or bullied her. So all those kids out there who feel um, you know, alone or rejected, here's a great way to get back at them. If you do this, all your friends will listen to tapes of you for weeks on end, and you know, this is just pushing all the buttons for mm -hmm. contagion. Um, it also portrayed in, in the show, for those of you who watched it, um, she went to try and get help from a school counselor who was very rude and dismissive, so it also portrays adults as not being helpful. Um, it suggests that um, her friends and family, because of the way she was treated, it was their fault that she killed herself, rather than portraying suicide as being complex. Um, and in the original version, they added something on later because of pushback. There was no, no mention of resources for um, mental health, or that the, the, this represents a mental health issue and that there's treatment for it that can be effective. Not to mention there was also a rape scene in here. I mean, this show was just a, a total disaster. Not to mention that because it was on Netflix, you could binge watch it, which I did, um, because I wanted to see what it was about. I ended up watching like eight hours in a row, and it really like messes with your yeah. sense of reality when you watch that all in one chunk. So you have all of this really um, triggering stuff that they're watching in this very mm -hmm. intense way. So this was a mess. And, and luckily, I, I don't know if they're going to have a third season, the second they are. season. They are? Yes, they are. The second season moved on, I think, to school violence. It was off suicide. But this is a, a good example of what not to do. Um, and then on a more kind of local level, um, in this era of cell phones and social media, um, you know, th this has caused a whole other avenue of contagion um, where, one, kids have access on the internet to images of self-harm, methods of self-harm. Um, kids also are exposed to more stressors over social media. So they used to be able to go home from school and be like, oh, that, I had a terrible day, but at least I don't have to go back until tomorrow. Um, but these kids, like, it, it continues all day, all night, bullying. Um, negative interactions, not to mention that, as Stephanie said, these teens seem to kind of bond together, um, probably because they, they feel like they understand each other, but you get a, 
group of teens who are all engaging in self-harm and are all suicidal, and they text each other all night long saying, I'm feeling suicidal, can you help me? We've had a ton of kids who say they don't sleep at night in case one of their friends contacts them. And we know that, number one, I mean, we need an adult to be handling this. They're, they're not going to be effective at helping each other. And they're triggering each other I intensely to keep thinking about this topic. Question. Um, yeah. So again, I guess my question would be, would social media fall under risk factors now? I mean, because if you think about it, because I, I don't know, but, but you had said something that, well, bullying is not, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't know, I guess I'm just trying to wrap my brain around this because I just see so much with social media now and teens, and I just see this correlation. So I, I think guess it's I was so just wondering. I think it's so challenging. Part of why the social media piece is so challenging is because when most of us grew up, right, I mean, we didn't have it, so it didn't have to, it, it was fine. We were right. fine without it. It is currently now, it is in the fabric of how kids communicate. So I, I just, it is part of their social fabric, and so without it, they're missing out on a part of socialization mm -hmm. that is really normative for their group. And so I think the best, you know, that we've kind of come up with is, you know, to have parents responsibly be monitoring, you know, their accounts in some ways, but that's imperfect as well because kids often will have, you know, an account that everybody sees and then they have their real account that other people don't know about. So it, it's, a, it's a really challenging, it's a very challenging problem. For some of our kids who struggle the most, we've, we, the parents have decided they don't get to be on social media but anymore. But also, too, you have parents who are just as, just as addicted to social media. I mean, you know, so therefore, there's just a whole breakdown of communication. So I, I, I don't know, I just, you know. I mean, I think, yeah, I, I think like all the other sorts of precipitating factors, we can't say social media itself is a cause of suicide um, or self-harm, but it definitely creates a new avenue for risk in terms of contagion. Um, Thank you. Okay. So as well as the ability for bullying or other negative peer interactions to continue for a longer period of time. Um, and so it, it increases risk in that way. Another way it increases risk is the kids who are staying up at night in contact with friends are then not getting adequate sleep. And we know that insomnia is a risk factor for suicidality. So it becomes sort of like a vicious cycle. Um, as Stephanie said, it's very challenging to find ways to intervene with this. And this is still very new. I mean, research. We don't know much yet in terms of research about how parents should be responding to this. So, so we use our, our sort of best clinical judgment, but this is in its infancy, sort of how parents and adults really should respond to this. We know from the kids that saying, okay, no, you can't have a phone, or no, you can't have any access to electronics, doesn't work, um, and it cuts them off from some of the positive things that they get from it, which is support from their friends. And kids who are depressed or suicidal do feel validated and get some help from the idea that other people understand them. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we try and do is we try and work with the kids and the families to, to find what we call a middle path where we talk with the kids, like, I know you really want to be helpful to your friends and it feels good that your friends understand you and, and that's great and let's talk about how you can actually help them versus put them more at risk. Because if you are talking to them about suicide, just using the word suicide, self-harm, any of that is triggering to them. So you can talk about difficulties, but don't use those words. Don't send images. We have kids who send pictures of their cuts to other kids. That, again, is a total disaster. And so we mm -hmm. um, talk to kids about that's actually dangerous, and they don't realize it. I had a kid once who had this very elaborate Instagram site with a, a ton of followers um, where she posted all sorts of extremely gory pictures of self-injuries, and she actually thought she was helping people because mm -hmm. people would write comments like, oh, you know, I feel like you understand me, or it's good to see that other people are going through this. And she thought it was helpful. And we had a very um, direct talk about why this was absolutely not helpful. And if she wanted to help people, it would be much more helpful to put up positive images of hope um, and reasons for living.
And so, you know, I had her delete the account in front of me. For all I know, she reinstated it two minutes later after she left. But she did change the content to put up poetry and other things that were more positive. So often the kids just don't know. And, and they do want to help their friends. And they're willing to um, work on this a little bit when you phrase it in that way. Um, so we do often tell parents to take the phone away at a certain time of night just because it's a sleep issue, an insomnia issue. And, and we don't want kids, we don't want kids up all night because they're, like you said, they're unsupervised. That's a high risk time at 3 a.m. when everyone's asleep and they're doing who knows what and getting texts from their friends about suicide. Um, so we don't want that. And we want them to get good sleep. So, you know, it does seem reasonable to say at, you know, 9 o'clock the phone, you know, goes, you know, goodbye <laughs> until the next day. But I, I think there's got to be some kind of middle path because if a parent says, I'm just taking away your phone, you don't have a phone, that, that, that doesn't always work either um, because the kid will lose trust in the parent. And, and so it's very hard to find a middle path. We have certainly had kids have the phone removed for a chunk of time if the situation is so dire that we feel that the benefits outweigh the cost. But this is a, a sort of thorny issue to navigate. But we encourage you to the extent you can, monitor social media use. Um, make sure your teen is getting adequate sleep and does not have the phone at night when they should be sleeping. And that they know if they're getting texts from friends saying they're suicidal, they need to tell you or another adult. That is not something that they should be trying to handle on their own. That is a problem that requires an adult. And often teens feel a huge burden lifted off of them when you tell them that because they feel that they should be helping their friends and they shouldn't be telling adults and they should be keeping secrets and, and that's often a huge burden for them. Okay, so just because we're here in Silicon Valley and this is always coming up in the media again, I thought I'd speak to this a little bit. So again, I don't think it's that simple. It's not that academic stress leads to suicidal behavior and all kids who, you know, have a ton of homework and feel that it's Harvard or bust are going to be suicidal. I mean, that's clearly way too simplistic. Um, I think that, again, suicide is the result of underlying um, risk factors and uh, psychiatric symptoms that combine with certain stressors. So for kids who are vulnerable to depression, to perfectionism, to comparing themselves to others, to hopelessness, the, the academic stress is something that they very quickly latch onto. Like if they live somewhere else, it might be something else. I grew up in Los Angeles, so like if you weren't going to be a movie star, you know, <laughs> you could, yeah. or you didn't look like a swimsuit model, you know, you could attach your perfectionism and self-criticism to that. Um, you know, here in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley, it's like being in a STEM field and going to, you know, an Ivy League university. So. Um, I do think that that is destructive for kids, but I don't think that on its own is the cause. Again, certain kids who are vulnerable are much more impacted by this than others, um, if that makes sense. There's no data showing that academic stress has any direct link to suicidal or self-harm behavior. Um, we do know, though, that all of the stress on kids, you know, doing homework until 3 a.m. And, and a lot, they all tell me I have that much homework. It's not that I put it off, but it takes that long, which um, is a problem. It can lead to increased stress. It can lead to lack of sleep, because they're staying up late to get all of this stuff done. Um, and that interacts with, again, perfectionism, hopelessness, self-criticism. And then you have a vicious cycle where someone could get more and more depressed um, and potentially be thinking about suicide or self-harm behavior. So again, it's a risk factor, but you know, because of the way it, it brings up all of these other issues. And of course, um, you know, like we do when we work with kids, it's important to reassure kids that there's multiple pathways to happiness and success in life. You know, academic success is not the only way. Um, and to you know, give them a sense of hope about the future and to try and help them to feel good about themselves. I mean, there's so many ways in our culture that people can feel bad about themselves. And it's important to be putting a lot of good stuff in their mind. So if you think about, they talk about this in a couples therapy too, five compliments for every one you know, constructive feedback you want to give can go a long way because we don't want kids backing themselves into a corner thinking it's Harvard or there's no point in life. Mm -hmm. And again, kids who 
have better coping strategies, are not vulnerable, are probably not going to start to think that, but the ones who have that vulnerability might. And so it's important to really um, work on that. And I know the schools are, are trying to change the culture, but it, it's slow going around yeah. here. Treatment yeah. approaches. Let's do this. Um, it's still me, it says. I know, I'm just getting ready because I'm next. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's not as much research on treatment as we would like. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, in including that people um, shy away from doing research on this because they don't want to deal with the anxiety or, or fears of what will happen if there's a bad outcome in the study. And so th there's a, a reluctance to do research on this. So there's a limited amount of research on treatment. And there's only a few treatments that have been shown to be effective in randomized clinical trials, which is sort of the gold standard for showing something is effective. Um, and dialectical behavior therapy, or DBT, right now is the only treatment that has been what we call replicated or shown to be effective in two different clinical trials with two totally different groups of investigators, um, meaning that you would hope that there's something about the treatment, not just a team of people who know what they're doing and whatever they do is going to work. So if you two different people did it, that gives it more credibility. So DBT right now is the only treatment that's been replicated. And, and that's unfortunate, but that's sort of the state of where we're at. Um, and so DBT is a, a comprehensive treatment program. Um, we do DBT here at CHC in an intensive outpatient program called the RISE program where kids come four days a week for three hours. That's an intensive version. At Stanford, we have the standard DBT for adolescents, which is two visits a week, one individual, one group, phone coaching. Um, it's a very comprehensive treatment, and we focus on helping kids learn how to regulate emotions so they don't have to use suicide or self-harm behaviors for that function. Let's see. And uh, I think we'll stop. I think we should there. stop. Yeah. yeah. Okay, questions? Yeah. Um, how can you know how to teach um, children or teens how to regulate their emotions? Has there been any uh, research between showing uh, whether um, in early childhood, if children already have those skills, uh, does it reduce um, the risk of uh, either NSSI or suicide when they become teenagers? Um, I don't know if there's any research definitively showing that. I think that would be... Like, theoretically, it totally makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that would be what people think, and there's, there's research to try and show that. There's also research studying early interventions around emotion regulation to see if that prevents later um, negative outcomes. Those studies take a long time to do because they're, you know, you have to get kids and they're like three or four and wait until they're... 15 or 20 and see what happens. But I think that's the thinking that yes, that um, not having, not for whatever reason, not mastering emotion regulation as a small child can then become a risk factor for suicidal and self-harm behavior later. And the hope is that early intervention can prevent that. I've only heard of one program, Good Behavior Game, that I think is out of England, I believe that has shown some research um, that's been around for years there that, um, and it's very early on, and um, the teachers do the program, and I think that that program has shown that there's a decrease in suicidal um, risk-taking behavior. Yeah, there's a lot of interventions, and some of them are um, designed specifically to, to see if they prevent suicide and others other things. Some of them are education-based interventions in schools. Um, there's, there's, I think there's multiple things, but nothing has emerged yet as sort of the gold standard. There's also research on implementing DBT in schools as a sort of basic core curriculum in health classes. But again, that research is new, so it's not clear yet how that impacts long-term outcomes. Also, because teens' brains change so, so much at that age that I was wondering whether the skills they learn earlier, are they still... Um, now they're already, are they still able to access them in this, those two years where they um, change a lot, I guess? I mean, I think theoretically the thinking would be that, yes, the more um, whatever the three-year-old version of self-soothing, 
and being able to calm oneself or to regulate an emotion would translate into an adolescent ability to do that, but it's not clear. And some kids may just have such a biological predisposition to I intense emotionality that it's just gonna overwhelm any effort to try and do anything constructive with it. But I think there's still a lot of research that needs to be done on that, but the field is definitely going in that direction around emotion regulation as a core uh, sort of competency to, to try and get kids good at early on to prevent some of this later stuff. Yeah. Can you address um, some issues around culture? It, can you be more specific? <laughs> uh, well, so how um, culture might affect a child's reaching out for help, either to their family or to, and how the family might deal with it. Yeah. I think we what we see most often, and you'll have to jump in and let me know if you agree with me or not, but I think what we see frequently is a child who for sort of all intents and purposes is an American child. So they grew up here, etc. Parents did not come here until they were adults or much later on in adulthood. So their context for you know, parenting and these kinds of things is, you know, not only in, from a different generation, but from an, an entirely different culture. And so some of the ways, for example, in DBT that we think about what we want to do, like when your child's express, expressing emotion, we want you to validate that emotion or, you know, these kinds of things are, there can be a real mismatch. And so some of the, you know, some of the I guess we see that in terms of the cultural issues coming in and figuring out, fig figuring out how to work with families, you know, respecting whatever cultural you know, richness they bring and their cultural background while also you know, helping the family function in a way that's also ultimately gonna lead the teen to health. Is that what you were asking-ish? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. And, and there is some data um, from some small studies, one of them which I did and one which a, a colleague of ours in Spain did um, using DBT with Latino patients and, and finding that it worked really well, in fact, possibly even better than for Caucasian families. So again, the, the role of culture um, you know, in, in treatment, I, I, there's still a, a lot of work to do on that, but I think you're right, one of the core issues is about um, attitudes towards help seeking, attitudes towards expression of emotion in the family. And, and we try and assess that for every family, um, both in terms of the larger culture and the culture within that unique family mm -hmm. and try and address it when we think there's a risk there. And, and to try and come up with culturally sensitive ways to, mm -hmm. to manage it. Thank you. Um, it seems like being here in the Bay Area, or I should say Silicon Valley, that there's an app for everything. <laughs> I read something in the um, business section, I'd like to get both of your opinions, because there's been so much negative feedback about you know, just social media, that they're now trying to create these apps where if you are predisposed to depression or whatever, that they're, I don't know, they're, they're trying to like utilize like social media now for the good in creating these apps and things. And I was just wondering, I mean, is this something that we see on the horizon now? Because we're all hotwired, you know, in this way. I think it's definitely on the horizon. I okay. think there's a, a huge trend in mental health to yeah. see if there can be computer-based or app-based interventions right. or computer-based or app-based surveillance of people at risk. I mean, there was an article, I think, in the New York Times that Facebook oh, yeah. has yeah. algorithms now for identifying people at risk and intervening and what the ethics were around that, like if the police show up at someone's door and, right. you know, why the heck are you here? Because face, you said on Facebook, I'm going to kill myself, but you didn't know anyone right. saw that. And, and, you know, what are the ethics if the person is not specifically seeking help in that um, venue? So I think... I mean, I think people feel in mental health that there's a huge power for good to harness from these and getting mm -hmm. people access to mental right. health treatment who might not otherwise have it. And I think there's also a lot of complex sort of ethical issues around social media right. and, and how to use that or not in ways that are responsible. Using HIPAA and privacy yeah. Issues, confidentiality. Yeah. So I was just curious what your yeah. what both your take was. Because it was a real fascinating article. I was just like Oh my gosh, you know, it's like some it was just it made my heart glad to say, okay, something something good 
can come out of social media instead of hearing all the negative stuff and how it's impacting you know, our teens. I think there's definitely the potential for good with it, mm -hmm. but I think it, there's a lot of issues to resolve okay. as well. And I think it's trickier around suicidality than something like depression or anxiety because you don't want a person telling an app, I want to kill myself, and there's no live person who can actually respond to that. Um, they're going to get an emoji, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I mean, maybe it's better than nothing, mm -hmm. but you know, it, it seems a little more straightforward with depression or anxiety where there's no actual risk, um, you know, presumably so. But okay. I think there's the potential for good and bad, and we're all just trying to figure out what those right. are. Yeah. Are there cases where there are no signs before the event? It's, it's a, maybe a stupid question, but oftentimes when we uh, see like people being interviewed, like a mom just lost her child, and they're like, we had no idea, we, there was no clue, like she seemed perfectly fine or happy. I think that it's possible that the that they didn't see any clues, but it's not possible that there were there was nothing going on. So, um, you know, sometimes kids are able to hide things, um, and I think that those people who die by suicide, you know, in some ways are able to hide it better than others because if they weren't, someone might have intervened. Um, I think sometimes people don't know what to look for. I mean, if you're not a mental health professional, I, I'm not sure how you would detect subtle signs of things, and teens often conceal stuff from their parents. So it might be very true that they didn't notice anything, but it's not true that nothing was going on. Um, and often, you know, friends knew things, or there were some signs, and, and some people are just really good at concealing things, and that's very, very sad for the families who then, you know, have to go through this torture of wondering if they could have done something, and often they couldn't. There just was not, you know. Sometimes, um, good academic achievement or like great grades in, uh, in schools will be misinterpreted as great mental health. Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. I think that, um, you know, if a kid looks like they're functioning really well, you know, it, it doesn't give a parent much reason to probe any further. Um, so, yeah, it, it's tricky. That's why we say just ask. I mean, all, I, I think almost all the teenagers in this area have been exposed to the topic of suicide in a way that kids from other areas have not because the schools have made efforts to put in programs related to this. The kids know about the suicide clusters through word of mouth. In my experience, the kids in Palo Alto and surrounding areas are much more aware of um, suicidality as well as mental health than you know other kids I've worked with. Like before I was here, I was in Los Angeles for many years. This topic did not come up in the same way, but the kids here, for better or worse, have had a lot of exposure to this, and I don't think it would be a surprise to ask them, hey, you know, I'm sure you know this has been an issue around here. Are you suicidal? Mm -hmm. And if they're not, they'll say no. I mean, it's not the case they're going to be like, I'm not, but now that you mentioned it, hey, that's a great idea. Um, you yeah, know, it you totally can, doesn't it, work it that way. It never hurts to ask. I don't know that we know that. Yeah, I, I don't think, think we that, know that. Um, the statistics we had up there actually were a little outdated. So right now, suicide is the second leading cause of death for 10 to 34-year-olds. Um, the absolute number of suicides in the youngest age group is smaller than in the older age group, but it, it's still proportionally um, one of the leading causes of death. Um, you know, again, the Santa Clara data showed that the highest number of deaths was in the young adults, and I think that's probably the case nationally, but I, I don't know if we can rule anyone out by, well, you're 14, not 15, so, you know, I, I, it's so variable, and it's moving towards a younger age. And there's been some data that, ac that actually differs by ethnic groups, and young African-American children are actually at risk of suicide at a younger age. And I don't think anyone knows why yet, but that's sort of epidemiological data. Do they have that? They have an ethical background um, for the suicidal rate. I just wonder if yeah. the Asian has higher rate. Um, they do. I'm trying to remember off the top of I my head. It changes either. every couple of years. Um, if you go on the CDC uh, website and you, you type in leading causes of death um, by ethnicity, it, it'll come up and they put out the CDC, CDC. Centers for Disease Control. They do, they do national surveillance of this every two years, and then they publish the data, and it, it changes. 
Um, for a while, at least among high school students, um, Latina females were attempting suicide most frequently, but that has shifted a little bit in the most recent data where it's African American females. But I mean, it, it shifts, it, it's very small amounts. So, um, you had a question. If there's uh, someone with a teen who has a lot of risk factors, has had and continues to have, and maybe has expressed this ideal uh, ideation and so on, then they're going to therapy. What should the relationship be with the therapist and the parent? Uh, especially with the confidentiality as they get older, uh, you know, if they, if the therapist says, I'm, you know, I don't think they're suicidal, that's all I'm going to tell you. Okay, that's a, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I have very strong opinions about that, and I believe 100% that the parent should be involved, and I will tell the kid in the first session, look, here's how this is going to work. If I am concerned about you, I am going to talk to your parent. I can't tell you in advance what's going to make me concerned. If I have any safety concerns, I'm going to tell them because your safety is more important than your privacy. And you know, you can continue to see me or not, but that's what's going to happen. Um, I do the same, but a lot of people don't. There's a lot of variation with this. So I, my situation, I've asked the therapist point blank if they won't tell me, right? And they say he's no longer suicidal. He doesn't come very close to the past. That's all you need to know. They do DPT and everything. They say, I'm not going to tell you. Yeah, there are real individual differences among providers for various reasons. I think providers get really anxious about, you know, if, if they, they think that if they tell everything, you know, tell these things to the to the teen's parent, then they're not going to tell the therapist anymore. And there might be some truth to that. I've never had difficulty with this. You've never had difficulty with this approach of which we are aware. So, yeah, sorry. I mean, I believe parents have a right to know. If I was a medical doctor and I thought a child had a medical illness, I mean, I can't think of a situation where I wouldn't tell the parent. I mean, I, I think the parent absolutely has a right to know, and that's how I practice. Um, and I would never want a parent, God forbid a tragic outcome occurs, to feel that they didn't do everything they could have done because they didn't know. So for me, that's I err on the side of, I, I don't want that to happen. I'd rather have a kid mad at me or say they won't see me anymore than the other way, and I, I, you know, but not everyone sees it that way. But but I, that I've been doing this a long time, and then that's what I feel clinically makes the most sense to me. But again, that, that's not to say anyone else is doing anything wrong. That's just how I do things. Yeah. So you have a situation where um, a child is expressing um, uh, suicidal sort of thoughts and is coming to an adult. Um, is there a way of kind of de-escalating de the um, situation other than removing um, uh, access to uh, you know, archivers or any weapons and such and or seeking help? But like when you're in a heat of the moment with a child, is there are there tips for de-escalation? Um, I think you know it's important to validate their feelings and, and to let them know that you know what they're going through makes sense, and to let them know that you're going to help them and you're there for them, um, that you will get them help if they don't already have help. And we usually talk a lot about sort of safety interventions at that moment, like don't leave the kid alone at all until you feel it's safe. Make sure they have no access to lethal means, and I think just provide a lot of support and, and love and, and reassurance. But, you know, it, it's hard to know how to definitively de-escalate something. So if you're in a tricky situation, I would probably err on the side of, um, you know, calling Uplift and having a mobile crisis team come out or going to the ER and, and having someone do a professional yeah. assessment. Yeah, so there, I mean, there are some folks who here who do DBT, um, and, you know, I think probably most kinds of parent training programs will help with some kind of validation or um, emotional attunement or, or that kind of thing. But, I mean, if you're just looking for validation specifically, like, we can teach it to you now. <laughs> so, um, um, I, I, 
listen to some books and they do uh -huh. examples saying this is what I think I'm like, and no way I could just intuitively just say things. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so there is a used to it. there's a psychiatrist at Stanford named Rona Hu. Um, H. U. who has done a lot of work with Asian American families and, and suicidality. They have a, she has a whole program around that. So you might want to look her up and, and see what she has to offer. Rona, R-O-N-A. And then her last name is Hu, H. U. I might be pronouncing it wrong, um, but she's a psychiatrist at Stanford and she's done a lot of work on this and often does presentations and um, things like that about the, that particular issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any questions for uh, working with a child who is resistant to seeking new treatment or counseling? Yes. How old? Uh, 14. Um, I might start by just you as the parent going in and getting some um, some skills for how to, you know, change your parenting a bit or work on your, or, you know, to respond to her in ways that might be more effective. And maybe over time she'll go in with you or the therapist might have some ideas for how to, but I would start just by you going in. That's my response. What do you think, Michelle? Um, yeah, I think that that's a very challenging situation. Yeah. I think, yeah, um, getting some advice around parenting and how to approach that as well as, you know, incentives never hurt. Uh, <laughs> Um, that's a good way to motivate kids to do things that they don't want to do, at least to get the ball rolling. Um, sometimes the kids are more willing to see the counselor at school um, than they that's are to, to be taken to a, a mental health professional or even their pediatrician. So you could try starting with other people who don't require going into a psychiatry building. Um, they might be more willing to do that. And a lot of the kids um, seem to benefit from the school counselors, and then they can facilitate linkage to more intensive care if needed. Is there any group therapy, or is it always one-on-one? We, we do not do group therapy for the most part for this issue because of the contagion effect. In DBT, we do multi-family skills group. The kids are in the room with their parents, which helps us contain, and we are very clear um, before they go into the group, you may not use the word suicide, self-harm, you may not talk about anything triggering, you cannot have any visible cuts, scars, anything like that, and we clamp down on contagion in every way we can. It's more like a class. There's no processing or, or kids sharing feelings with each other, and so we, we keep it very tightly regulated because of the contagion. Um, putting kids who are suicidal in a process type group is, is not a good idea clinically, yeah. They spelled the group as Alpina Hospital, is it? Aspire? It, it, in, I, I think that's what it is too, right? Where they have the group uh, therapy? So IOP programs, you know, it's a little tricky. And we, we have an IOP program here, um, which is DBT based, because you have this milieu aspect where the kids are together in groups, and, and that's part of IOP, because part of it is, is them being out of the house and in a safe place for a chunk of time a day, and there's other kids there like that, and so we do the same thing as we try and be really, really careful what goes on in the groups, and they are not in any way process groups, because that, that's a big mess where they start talking about things that trigger each other, so we try and keep them very skills and activity focused, multiple clinicians in the room to immediately jump in if anything problematic at all occurs. Would you add anything? Mm -mm. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to add that in my experience with crisis text lines, a lot of kids will open up on text. Yeah. Will not open up to a therapist verbally or on the phone or to parents. You know, I, I got to do it. Um, and they, I, but they'll they'll text all day long to their friends and everything. And they get up to somebody, I guess, stick or something if they want. Um, but um, uh, they'll open up and, uh, you know, the, People like me are trained to, to deal with them. We're not the professionals, necessarily. There are some professionals there. But uh, they, they'll talk, they'll talk away. And there's a whole process we go through on how to discuss things with them. And then if it needs to be escalated to one of the professionals, uh, it is, and uh, it, it works uh, for the most part. Yeah, that's a great resource because yeah. I agree, kids are much more likely to text than to reach out in any other way. How do you feel about? Um,
uh, other adults when they, they refuse to talk to the parent, can you make you know, a suggestion to talk to another parent? I just had somebody two days ago, uh, my daughter's best friend that currently is going through issues, her mom contacted me and said, no, you deal with things like this. Can I, can I get her to talk to you? So how do you guys feel about that? That's yeah, a, I don't know. Better, but. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think trying to get, you know, if someone's struggling and they're suspected this kind of dangerous behavior, right? E you know, even though, I mean, I know, I think the probably the first recommendation would be to try to get that person into um, for a mental health evaluation, like a comprehensive mental health evaluation to really get an understanding of what's going on. And of course, you know, any, in any links in the community where that child is going to be supported are going to be great. I mean, that's never going to be a, a bad thing. Right. Yeah. For those who are refusing. Oh, just, so, tagging on to that, um, if one, if, you know, there seems the concern around, say, a comprehensive mental health evaluation or mm -hmm. seeking We do hear a lot of that. Like, is this going to go on some kind of record? No. Is this going <laughs> to? <Yeah>. So, <laughs> and, and I mean, the other piece of it is, I mean, I don't, I don't know, I can't think of any. Well, I don't want to make any extreme statements because we're being recorded. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but tip. But what I would generally say is, you know, if you have a kid who's struggling with these kinds of very serious issues, you know. It doesn't matter where they go to college if they're not alive. So, <clears throat> so there's that piece. The the other piece is uh, there. Uh, none of this stuff is going to go on their record. Maybe you know. I mean, I think the way that mental health typically affects kids' records is maybe you know their grades are lower during certain times, or there's a semester where they've dropped several classes, or that kind of thing. But schools are used to working on this stuff and are super creative around like you know, kids finishing credits and being on schedule and. Yeah. yeah, and I think like we said before, for the kids who are really stuck on the stigma aspect, mm -hmm. that's where trying to go through non-mental health routes to start can be helpful, like a school counselor, even the guidance counselor, it doesn't have to be the psychologist, um, or the pediatrician might be a way in to at least be talking to someone who can then link them to more specific services. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I heard about the, I didn't hear about the question, I heard about the movie. Well, they, they showed the movie a couple <laughs> times, right, and, and then they asked questions and everything. It was all um, a text, a text based thing, whatever, and you could see on the screen, and you could see on your phones and everything, as they went up and a whole bunch of people hit like to move it up to the top. Will uh, admitting that you're suicidal uh, to a therapist or something uh, affect the uh, possibility of getting into a good university? And that was moving up and up and up and up, and a whole bunch of other good ones were Yeah, so well, in this area, out. yeah. Hey, ladies, I want to say fabulous lecture. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much.